good, oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you all Andy hear Lager. me? Sorry. Okay, we're good to go. All of the best, uh, Andele. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please confirm if you can see my screen and uh, from Audible. Yes, we're happy. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's just it is after midday. Uh, my name is Andile Gwebu, and I'm the current CISA YPF uh, Chair for Houting North. I'm an industrial, professional industrial engineer, and um, and currently an asset manager at Money Industries. Um, I'll be the facilitator for today's uh, engagement, um, the 67 minutes of engineering mentorship and engineering for engineering and built environment students and graduates webinar. Um, so the, the the purpose of this engagement is uh, basically to 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 provide guidance and um, insight into uh, how various professionals have progressed in their careers. Um, in the engineering and built environment fraternity, um, they share their experiences as well as um, provide insights into um, uh, interview tips, uh, how to handle yourself throughout your professional development, how to plan your career, and also basically to, in 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 essence, hold your hand in some of the the, the difficult tasks of, of of starting a new a new career, especially in engineering and built environment um where if you look basically from the time that you've been through school you've been guided and you have had assignments to basically take you through your training and your learning but once your career starts you basically have to plan it and think through it on your own so uh, you have professionals who speak through this session to basically give you a guide and to take you through how their journey has been and um, provide insights as to how to progress also in your career um I'll, I'll just move to the starting slide um so so the reason why to attend this session is to engage industry professionals uh learn how to craft and draft an exceptional cv for those who are still job seeking and also to shine your interview as well as learn from the journey of the role models as mentioned we have um, some exceptional role models as part of this panel and There'll be a lot to learn, a lot to discuss uh, from their experiences, as well as um, other topics that we discussed, uh, developing a professional outline uh, and presentation and uh, having strong professional presence and uh, confidence in your interviews, as well as um, optimizing your online profiles, networking profiles and how to apply tools like LinkedIn in your job search and also leveraging from internships and relationships uh, in your circle and also in, in, in the professional communities that exist to uh, start off your career and to get you engaged with other professionals. Um, so the topics that we'll cover are learning from the journey from role models, insights into job seeking, shining in an interview, uh, being an active participant and being part of the inclusion and diversity, as well as conventional and expand engineering roles. Um, and this could be expanding skills, through the different different professions, entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation, um, and our panel provides that that platform and that uh, capability to engage at that level. We have uh, different skills and different backgrounds, and that that will be quite good with regards to providing you the additional insights um, in in the type of engagement that you'd like to have. So to start off our engagement, um, job seeking, shining interview, and learn how to craft an exceptional CV, uh, I'll hand over to Jabulile Msiza, who's part of our panelists. Uh, so Jabulile Msiza is, uh, the, is a qualified civil engineer from, from US of Pretoria with, an honors, with double honors in geotechnical engineering and environmental engineering, both from the University of Pretoria and an MBA from Henley Business School through the University of Reading, uh, obtained in 2018. 
She's a professional engineer registered through EXA, and she's currently the director and HOD of the Waste Engineering Department at Jones and Wegener Engineering and Environmental Consultants. Her specialty lies in the field of solid waste management, including design, construction, and management of hazardous and general landfill sites, and coal stockyards for over 16 years experience. Um, I'll hand over to you, Jabli, to take us through. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, just to make sure that I'm on the right page, Chair, um, for now I must just do an intro um, and everyone else will do an intro and then we'll come back um, and do presentations. Is that correct? Um, you will do the presentation at this, at this point right now. So oh, I have the basic intro, yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, if I may then, um, I'll just share um, my screen. Um, can I confirm that you can see that? Um, yes, we can. All right. So good afternoon to everyone online. Um, really excited to be here with you for this next hour. And um, just to share the journey um, and just share some tips um, in terms of helping you with the journey. Um, honestly, very um, easy session, I hope, um, and I hope that we'll have a lot of engagement. So just to talk about myself, um, there was that um, bio shared by Andy Le. Thank you very much. Um, and I've just put it in bullet form um, in, in terms of where I've started and where I currently am. Um, so, of course, I studied at the best university in South Africa, the University of Pretoria, um, and they basically um, developed a love for geotechnical engineering, um, which led to me, even when I completed my studies, I, I finished my last exam and the next Monday, um, I started work at Jones and Wagner, who had funded my studies um, and um, continued at Jones and Wagner and through their support, um, through um, an internal bursary program, managed to get a geotechnical um, engineering honors degree as well as environmental, um, because the more I learned, um, the more I could direct my further studies um, and the more curious I became in certain things. Um, yeah, and through the years, um, the hard work has paid off. I've had no other reason um, but to stay at Jones and Wagner um, and, and, and um, continue my growth there. Um, and, and, and work hard really. Um, and, and I guess it shows um, in the progression that is shown here. So I'm currently still a director at Jones and Wagner. I'm still doing a lot of engineering work and grateful for that. Um, I missed all of the management responsibilities as well. Um, I'm currently the chairman of the board of Jones and Wagner. Um, yeah, all that said, these are the real bosses. Um, my two sons, age 12 and seven, um, and these are the, the reasons why when, when times get tough, um, I look back and um, remember that I'm doing this for them. So um, in, in, in our chats today, we, you know, we, we, we've all been told there's a certain way um, that we are going to progress. Um, and it is a societal stereotype in a way, you know, um, that you're born, you go to school, you graduate, you hopefully meet the love of your life have children, work, die. Um, but just remember in, in everything you do, um, we are all unique beings and our path is um, individual. Um, and, you know, the young people have this um, sleigh in your own lane. Um, remember that the lanes are not all straight. Some are curved, um, some um, stop and end. Um, just remember that there is no um, path set for all of us and we need to craft it as we go um, and remember that it, it is okay um, to be different. So looking back um, in terms of my journey, um, what has worked for me is that coming to work, I realized that yes, I have qualified with a four-year degree, but there's a lot I don't know. I've been taught a certain way to think, and um, that is about it. Um, I need to come and be prepared and have an attitude to learn. Um, and what has also helped in the journey um, is engaging in further studies um, so that I could better my craft um, as an engineer technically. Um, getting involved in the company 
um, putting your hand up. Um, so when there's talks, getting involved. Um, when there's um, social events, getting involved. Um, if there's committees that need um, representation of some sort, getting involved because that not only gives you um, access um, to um, company information, but also to people um, that you can interact with um, in a different setting than just um, discussing projects. Um, also just remaining curious. Um, Um, to assist someone muted you. Uh, sorry, please unmute. Sorry about that. Um, no, it's still muted. So I was just speaking to myself the whole time. Uh, not the whole time. I think maybe the last two sentences. <laughs> I see. All right. Thank God. OK, um, let me then carry on. Um, so so maybe I should leave this um, the, the next part um, after everyone else has um, introduced themselves. Then we can go into the tips of crafting a good CV. Um, as well as tips for the interview. I think for now, um, Chair, with your permission, I'll just stop at that point and give the others an opportunity um, to share. Andy Le? Um, Sorry, I was speaking to myself as well. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the next speaker is um, the, 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 the other speaker that we have in part of the panel is uh, Mr. Glozimnisi, who's the SIC FLP chairperson and construction project manager, uh, Joburg Region, uh, Gauteng. Uh, Department of Human Settlements. He is a construction project manager with nine years experience, knowledgeable with PFMA, construction building management, implementation of housing projects and technical procedures or methods, as well as building legislation policies and projects. His competencies are project management, technical consulting, decision making, team leadership, uh, construct, contract management, stakeholder engagement, uh, planning and organizational skills, uh, to mention just a few, uh, I'll ask that Mr. Lozi, you quickly introduce yourself and thank you. Um, hi, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think this is a, a, a good platform. I think that was a beautiful introduction. Um, can, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK, no, perfect. Um, as as uh, our facilitator has spoken, uh, my name is Lozim Nisi, um, working for the Department of Human Settlements. And um, through my expertise in terms of um, how I, I found myself in this position, I would um, say that it was, it was I, sh I should say maybe the lack of endurance and also having to persevere um, to get to to where one wants to to be, um, I studied in 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 TUT where I did my undergrad um, in in civil engineering and continued to do my uh, BTEC in urban engineering, and then ultimately then uh, work for the Department of Human Settlements. But before that, I had um, a stint at um, private some private private organizations. Uh, it, one was um, DS Smith, they were an architectural company, and then also worked for the IDT where I did uh, a lot of project management uh, with the company. So now I'm within, I would call it my spare time. A lot of people have hobbies. So I think I will, I can say that being the, the chairperson of SICE uh, um, Future Leaders panel, I would say it's my extramural activity. 
Um, so I think through my presentation, I'll go through more in terms of um, what um, we've I've discovered personally, and that I think it's things that can help uh, a lot of people to to develop within their careers. So yeah, I think that that's that's my that's my two cents. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the intro. I'll move over to the next presenter. Our next speaker is uh, is Busisi Ngumalo. Uh, Busisi Ngumalo is a chemical engineer uh, with six years experience in water and waste wastewater treatment uh, and one year in the manufacturing sector. She has uh, knowledge of water and wastewater treatment and environmental conservation experience. She's a master's holder currently working towards professional registration. Busisi, please. Take us through your introduction. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So you can hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So as noted in my introduction, so I'm still at a relatively um, early stage in my career where I finished a graduate program about two years ago. And so my career journey started with me studying chemical engineering at the University of Cape Town. And my recruitment journey started on campus where you'd have a lot of companies come in and they tell you what they do, what graduate programs they have in place and how they can further your career. And so at that point in my life, I took an interest at PPC Cement. And after a year of working within the manufacturing industry, um, at that time in 2017, Everyone in Cape Town, because I was studying at UCT, everyone in Cape Town, the big buzz was day zero. We're not going to have water, water short shortages in South Africa. And I felt like I want to be a part of that industry and contribute in whichever way I can, because water is an important resource to us all. And so at that point, having been in the manufacturing industry, cement um, to be specific, I realized that that's the career that I want um, to pursue. And the first tip and lesson at that point that I had is do not ever be afraid to start over. While cement is important because it builds our schools and our homes, I felt a certain pull and calling towards the water industry. And so in terms of then moving from having experience in manufacturing and trying to get into consulting, I worked towards ensuring that I relate or convey that the skills I had learned in manufacturing can still be transferred in the water industry because chemical engineering as a whole is about taking a raw product, a raw material, a raw anything, applying a black box of process design or equipment design so that you end up with a final product. And while I was in PPC, predominantly that meant mining limestone, applying process engineering um, um, design tips and tricks, and we end up with cement. I then made sure that I relate that the skills are still transferable in water because essentially we're still taking water from a river, applying chemical processes, tips and tricks and equipment to then end up with a raw product, which is us opening water in the morning um, to drink or brush our teeth. So it's important to relay that your skills are transferable across the industries. And so I started off then um, my, my water journey at Bosch Projects. And the important thing at that point was also moving from manufacturing to consulting was identifying um, courses that I could take so that I understand the consulting industry and understand where I fit in. And one of the courses was offered by CSET, the business of consulting engineering school where I then learned um, the business of consulting and where I could add value. At that point, um, I was in a graduate program for three years. At a certain point, I realized that I am entirely too curious and 
discover that I actually want to do a master's program and take my water knowledge a bit further. That was actually inspired by um, a site visit and a conversation that I had on site with an elderly man who had found me um, at a site inspection and asked me how old I am. And I told him, so I'm not going to reveal how old I am. When I told him how old I am, he said, you know, um, before you were born, I didn't have water. Um, you are now a young professional. I still don't have water. And chances are you're going to retire and I still will not have running water. And so that stayed with me um, for a while. It still stays with me. And so I decided I want to contribute more and further in the in the industry. So I looked for master's um, scholarship opportunity opportunities to then pursue a master's degree internationally. So I spent the last year in England doing a master's degree in water and wastewater treatment to try and see if I could get best practices or international um, experiences that I could then apply locally to better or further our industry. Thereafter, um, I joined ACOM, where I'm currently working as a design engineer, pat particularly in asset planning um, for Irish Water. Again, still trying to see if I can derive international um, experience to then apply to the local context and see how I can um, further the sector as is currently. And so that is currently where I am in my journey, still trying to see how I can add value within the sector as a whole and not just necessarily as a process engineer, but rather to see how I can contribute to the business of water as a whole and to ensure that while we have electricity and load shedding, we don't get to a point where we have water shedding. Thank you. Antile, hello. Um, th thank you for the introductions, Mrs. Hill. I'll introduce our next speaker, uh, who's uh, uh, Philip Boyens, is a director at SCIP Engineering Group. Philip is an, he describes himself as an enthusiastic and spirited civil engineer with a good sense of humor, uh, possessing 25 years experience in uh, human settlement development. Uh, he, he describes his top achievements as the start of the construction of the Hood Run mega project, and the new double story mall of Tembisa. Um, additionally, his uh, top pro professional achievement is driving his company's adoption and implementation of cloud based business processes work for workflow optimization and automation. Uh, he has a mixed set of specialties, which include property development, municipal engineering, uh, implementation of technology uh, through cloud based business processes and workflow uh, optimization and automation. Development on Dolomite, um, which I think is something that he'll touch more on and, and tell us how that how that went. Residential developments and uh, subsidy housing development. Um, I'll hand over to you, uh, Philip, to uh, describe to to go through your introduction further. Thank you very much, Andile. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, as uh, I've been introduced. The, um, the the topic is quite broad, and uh, as I as as you've seen, that I've been. I said I've got twenty five years, but I I missed two years somewhere. I counted quickly, and I actually realised I've got twenty seven years of experience now. Um, my journey started very very long ago. I think probably longer than some people like to think back, but in 1995, I graduated from the previous version of the University of Johannesburg called Rand Afrikaans Universiteit. And then you must please excuse me because I'm Afrikaans and sometimes my English um, gets the better of me. I usually only use that in self-defense and that even goes further for my skill set in in Zulu and some of our other Africa, uh, South African languages. Um, so I graduated in 95, started working in 96. Uh, in, in that process, I learned a lot. I was exposed mostly to municipal engineering, essentially 
um, some of my friends and the enemies in the in the let's call it the environmental side of things don't like it when I call it or I summarize it and simplify it. I, I've I've got a skill set to change a farm into a town, and um, that's usually where people get worried about. Sounds like I'm destroying, assisting destroying farms, but. Uh, we are creating human settlements for people and especially in the RDP and the affordable space. Um, I continued learning and um, eventually in 2012 became a director at the company where I'm working at. And since then, um, one of the other interesting things that I've done was being involved for I think about three, three or four periods of three years, being the head of our um, professional resource team, delivering um, houses and projects for hunting human settlements. And then after that, got more involved in the private sector. And as, as was mentioned, a, a huge achievement and a, big chunk out of my life was the design and implementation of the Mall of Tembisa. Our involvement there was civil and structural engineering. Um, fortunately, there was a full set of professionals involved, quantity surveyors, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, architects, finishing specialists, uh, uh, energy experts, uh, the whole, the whole um, grouping was there. And we could focus only on our our part of the business, and um, the time frames were quite tight. But my first involvement on a shopping center, and um, that's a different kettle of fish. If somebody else got that experience, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Things keeps on changing, but the only thing that stays the same is the opening date of the shopping center. So that just never moves, but uh, drawings get changed, walls get moved, shops get swapped around. That was quite interesting. And to make it even more interesting that the, the project was done on um, high risk dolomite. And um, they also learned a lot. I worked there closely with uh, Trevor, Trevor Green from Jones and Warner, who assisted us with the speciality the designs of the piles. And um, currently I am also dealing with our in technology at the company and um, developing and finding clever ways of doing business and also doing drone surveys. We've got our drone and we're doing 3D models of our sites for pre-development and afterwards post-development. And I think that's, that's in a nutshell for me. Um, back to you. Mr. Program Director. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, Philip, for the introduction. Um, just, just a few questions for to our panel uh, as begin of uh, the session. I'd like to ask uh, to Jabulile, um, how how did you get your first job? Uh, if you can just take us through through that process. All right. So, um, as I said before, um, I was a bursary student. I was very fortunate um, to have a bursary um, with Jones and Wagner. So, um, part of my bursary um, had a, a work back commitment period. Um, so, it meant that I was guaranteed a job in essence. Um, but what also helped me is that um, during my studies, I would come um, on vacation work um, at Jones and Wagner and learn the company and get some training. Um, but yeah, um, my I got my first job through my bursary. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think specifically you mentioned something in the beginning of our, our discussion about um, how you had interactions with uh, the professional bodies during your varsity and now that led to your first job. Can you just take us through that? So um, I think um, I th what's important to note because we also, oh, sorry, was that for you? <laughs> um, it, it was for, for for yourself and for Spusisi as well. Okay, no, she can go ahead, yeah. Okay. 
Yes, okay. So um, as mentioned, uh, so I studied at UCT and during close to um, all the vacation periods, we'd have a lot of companies on campus various industries who would come in, have a little showcase um, and talk about um, the companies, what services they offer and how, what graduate programs they have and opportunities outside of graduate programs, such as coming in for four weeks or six weeks during um, your summer vacation to just get um, a feel of what that industry is. I was also a part of, if I remember, I'm remembering now, I actually had forgot this as well, this um, Girl Inch. So at that time as well, there was the Girl Inch program being run by Unilever. And at, I think at all points in my life, I've always been someone who hand up and says, okay, I want to see what that's about. I want to try um, try that. So when they came as well on campus, I signed up, um, went to Unilever for, in my first year, I think I did um, a, a few weeks at Unilever. In my second year, I think I did a few weeks at SAB. Um, and finally, um, with the company that was my, um, my first job was PPC, doing four weeks there. So it's going around the different industries and taking advantage of all the opportunities that they have and applying for them and seeing what it is that you like. So when they come to campus, you know, we'd all have that... Uh, that sense that, you know, they always came with freebies. We're like, oh, let's go grab some free pens from the companies. Don't really like pay attention to what's really being said. But at the end of the day, you know, we signed up, we took advantage of the opportunity and it materialized into work experience, which then materialized into a job. Thank you. We can't hear you, Andile. Oh, sorry, I'm talking to myself here. Uh, th th thank you for thank you for that, Jablin. Thank you for that, uh, Cecilia. Just taking it a step further, uh, I'd like to know from Josie, with regards to your current role, um, how did you end up there? Um, how did you move from private sector to to public sector? Um, yeah, no, thanks. Are there, um, what 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 happened for me um, was. In terms of my 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 schooling, um, in terms of varsity, I received a scholarship from the Department of Human Settlements, and um, this was for my undergraduate uh, qualification, a national diploma. And then what what then happened was that uh, as part of the um, should I say the the contract itself, it was then to then say, look, after you're done there's an opportunity you can come and work for us. But in terms of giving a perspective of what this means or what the what was the intention of the department, it was to address the, the, the challenges that we have of uh, skilled professionals within uh, the public service. Um, and when the opportunity came for them to then say, look, uh, we'll fund you and then you can come work for us. Um, for me, it was it was something that that I think it was it was a good thing, and I found myself after having to have gained that uh, experience with uh, within the private sector when they said come and work for us. Uh, the nice thing I saw I see Philip uh, was speaking about projects that they they're doing with uh, uh, within the human settlement space because that's a space that I specialize in from a project management perspective. So um, I I had to then decide to then say look. Um, we can't say that government doesn't have uh, professionals yet. We are leaving the space in terms of not going into it. So, so that's 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 what I made that decision when they said, "Are you going to be able to come and work and stay?" I said, "It's fine. I'll come and work and stay." So, so I've been with the department for some time, and I found that even some of the crazy things, some of my lectures are now my clients. So, so which is nice, uh, or rather, not not clients but service providers in this case. Um, so, 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 yeah, it's 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 just that twist between the two, to say you must somebody must do it, and if we don't think that somebody needs to do it, then we'll always be complaining as 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 professionals to say uh, government is not listening to us. Um, so, so yeah, that that's that's my story on how I I joined the department. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you for that, Lucy. And I, I, I like that in our panel we have two directors here. So I'll throw something at, at you, Philip and Jabulil. 
Um, I think the, the the common thing from the past three speakers uh, in our panel is that it was graduate placements and graduate uh, graduates being funded all the way up until they then got hired. Um, are they? What is your thinking around the benefit of that from your organizations, uh, Jawli and Philip, and also? Is there something that your organizations are currently doing in that regard to then empower graduates and and, uh, and early professionals? I'll start with you, Philip, and then over to you, Jabal, after. Thank you. Thank you, Andile. Um, yes, uh, there's, a, there's a common misconception, I think, and I think it was really driven by the cell phone contract where this whole thing that you that you must upgrade your phone every two years and now recently this the tech companies have uh, bought out this idea that no two years is too long to wait to make money so now they're bringing out a new model every every year and now you're stuck with a two-year contract but then this that thing went through to careers so people felt and i think it's in certain corporate worlds they reckon that you, if if you, you not upgrading your 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 career every two years, you are falling behind. Now that could possibly be something in I don't know in insurance or something like that. But in engineering, it's it's really difficult to gain the the necessary skills by company hopping. So even if you look at Jabulile's um, sort of career path. I just quickly made a note here. She, she's been she's been at the same company for 17 years. Now, in terms of this mobile upgrade your career thing, that she's overstaying a welcome almost by a factor of nine. Nine times two. That's 18, <laughs> if I'm not wrong. But that that is what's valuable. You you need consistency. And if if there's time, I would like to flash the the life lessons on the screen later on. Otherwise, I can just share it with the audience. Um, and that's one of the things. When when I was at the the infrastructure in Daba last year, um, the COO of Escom Jan Oberholzer spoke. And he asked, he posed the question, that's also my life lessons. He posed the question to the audience, how do you gain 25 years of experience? And there was a huge quiet in the audience. And then he came with the obvious answer by working for 25 years. There's, there's no other way to get the experience. So uh, Jabulile, congratulations on your 17 years and congratulations on your most recent recruitment that is a really really good example for other young recruit young graduates that's it's really the life path so yeah I, I hope it comes across that i think it's a good idea to stay at the same place and gain experience yeah no thank you very much for that philip um, so I just want to say I'm such an advocate um, for our bursary scheme um, at Jones and Wagner. Um, so we currently do have uh, bursary um, applications open until the end of July. So if there are any students here who are wanting to apply, please head over to our website www.jaws.co.za. Um, and you can um, follow the link um, to submit a, a bursary um, application there. Um, the requirements are stated there. So um, having had gone through the process, um, I can say that I, I actually um, oversee our bursary program. So I'm also the, the, the bursary um, administrator um, and we get a lot of applications um, and uh, we try to accommodate as, as, as many as possible. But the beauty of a bursary program is that then you get into the vacation work schedule, um, you get to um, do some on the job training um, and you get guaranteed work later. So um, please um, do consider applying. And I know um, I'm sure maybe Skip also does, but there's a lot more companies um, who have um, bursary programs and you can just Google that. Uh, we advertise, um, for example, Sibusi Sibusi Siwe was saying that she was at UCT. There is a UCT handbook, um, which um, at the back also lists um, available bursaries. Um, so just look at the handbooks um, of the institutions you're at um, and you can get more um, information on, on bursary programs there. 
Excellent. Um, that they, thank you for that, Philip and Chabulil. So, uh, so in the remaining time that we have, our our request that if uh, Chabulil you can take us quickly through the job seek seeking aspect of 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 your presentation and shining in an interview. I think if we can keep it to, let's say three to five minutes. Or so. All right, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Um, so what I wanted to say is, um, see my screen? Yes, we can, thanks. All right, so in, in terms of a CV, um, try to just keep it as neat as possible, that it's easy to read, um, that it's in a clear and organized format. Um, I think some people like to go all fancy and things are popping out here and there's uh, many colors um, and, and you can um, lose someone's attention sometimes if they're struggling to find the basic information that they need from your CV. So keep it neat um, and, 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 and clean. Um, proofread. There's, there's nothing as bad as finding spelling mistakes in a CV and you're wondering, is this person really serious about finding work? So proofread it. And sometimes you've been looking at it too long. Ask someone else to check it for you. Um, another thing, include all the requirements um, that are stated on the advert. Um, so um, if, if you've sent a CV and now uh, I'm trying to review it and I'm missing your matric certificate, I'm missing your academic record, um, and, and I've got 600 to look at, um, it becomes very easy to disqualify it because of that. Um, so include everything that is necessary. Um, have a well-written um, motivational letter um, as, 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 as part of an addendum to your CV um, and, and personal, uh, personalize that um, for the company that you are applying at. So don't have the standard um, thing where you're saying, um, I would like to work at your company because of that. You know, say, I would like to work at Jones & Wagner because I care about the environment and I like the environment where engineers and scientists are working together to provide um, solutions um, for clients. Um, so um, personalize that motivational letter. Um, in terms of um, next, in terms of the interview, be prepared. Um, research again. And if you know, um, if you've been given the names of the people that are going to be interviewing you, research, find out about them so that when you arrive, you can um, start conversations um, and ask specific questions that that, that shows um, a level of interest as well. Um, arrive on time, I cannot overemphasize that. Um, dress comfortably, right? Um, so some people will go and find their Sunday best and it's quite uncomfortable or, you know, um, they, they can't breathe anymore and they're not presenting the best selves. So be, be comfortable. I mean, if you come to the office here, none of us are wearing ties or anything like that. But all these candidates arriving are, are, are coming in suits and we're like, oh, just relax. Um, so, 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 so come um, ready for success. And if you're squeezing into an outfit um, already, that's not going to present you well. Um, answer the questions fully. So if you ask a question, don't don't answer half of it. Answer it fully, um, and don't be shy to ask for the question to be repeated. Um, sometimes you didn't hear it clearly, or sometimes you you basically maybe need an extra thirty seconds to think through it. Just say, can you please repeat your question? Um, and if you don't know, just say, listen, um, I haven't learned about that. I, I, you know, I can research it later, or I can learn about it. Don't go making up a story and embarrassing yourself and you're completely on the wrong path. Um, there's actually, you gain more respect by being able um, to show that you don't know, uh, but you're willing to learn. Um, also, just um, the worst thing is at the end of the interview, you ask someone, do you have any questions? And they're like, nothing, nothing. Um, have something prepared, um, even if it's, you know, um, you asking the people interviewing you to to tell you about their story in the company to just ask something in the end um, to show some initiative. So that's that's the tips that I would like um, to leave with you for now. Um, that th thank you for the presentation, Charlie. I'll hand over to Lozi to take us through the your part of the presentation around being an active participant and being part of inclusion and diversity organization. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think, um, let me just put on mine. You tell me if you can see it. Um, there's nothing coming through yet. Okay. How is it now? Not yet? No, not yet. Okay, something's coming through. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Please put it please put it on presentation mode. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you um very much. So so what I would what what my my presentation is will be about um is um how does one be able to to engage um, within a, a your career? Um, what 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 I found personally as a as, as as part of the experience that I've gained is that you know a lot of when when as young people when you grow up you you don't know what it is that you want you think you know what you want but you don't know what you want. Um, also, what you then find is that. Because you don't know what you want, the 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 decisions that you end up taking end up leading you the 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 should I say the wrong path, and then you only then will discover the 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 lessons and the mistakes that you've made only so far ahead. So what I what I would like to say, especially within our um, career in terms of engineering, a lot of people have not seen it as rather a, a profession that one can grow old in. But um, I've, I I remember I've had, a, uh, there was a colleague who recently uh, retired from our organization. And, and after that, he still continued to do some work privately. So in terms of becoming a somebody who gets first to understand how can I become active in the spaces that uh, I'm interested in, is firstly understand what is it that you like, you know? What is it that you like? What is it that actually uh, you are able to even work for free for some of these things, which because at, a, at an earlier um, stage of your, of your career, there's opportunities that will come, but because they come in, in a manner that you had not expected, you might not find yourself taking them. Um, so, so that's one thing I would I would definitely encourage. Um, what happened with me was um, in the time when I was looking for my experiential training, um, I I found myself having to uh, meet or rather put myself in positions where I will meet people who are already in the field and have a sense and a space of networking. You know, I created that. I remember. I think I don't know how many business cards I have. I had actually they're still there. Um, but it was probably over 50, if not 60, uh, business cards. That that was the era of, of business cards. I think now I've changed. Things have changed now. You know, you've got people on LinkedIn and so stuff like that. So what I'd say is first know, know yourself, know what is it that you like and what your values are so that when you go out there, uh, you are able to understand the type of uh, person that you that you want to become and also what opportunities you can take to become that person that you want to become. And um, that's where when I think currently I, I, I would like maybe to indicate that my relationship, for example, with an organization like CISA and, and SICI, which I'm currently um, the chairperson of the Future Leaders Panel, which is a youth division within a SICI. SICI is the South African Institution of um, Civil Engineers. Um, um, what what happened was that I decided to say I want to have more information within my profession of study. And then once I did that, then I found myself having to be exposed to a lot of people um, who I would then say um, this person is good for this 
and that person is good for that, which then helped me also to identify the stream of career because within, for example, I'm a civil engineer uh, by, by, by qualification, uh, currently practicing as a project manager. I had to also find what my speciality, speciality is. Is my speci speciality within a space of water structures or, or road engineering? But um, what, what I found is I'm, I'm more of a project manager. And also this was a space that I then you know, went into. So you ultimately have to take that action. But the people who I surrounded myself with, who I was able to ask around in terms of taking action um, and comparing on, on op options and opportunities that are there for you. I was only able to do that because of the network I built. And through that, then I was able to make a decision. So um, having to have been now serving on, on Future Leaders panel, um, there's uh, platforms that the organization has created to deal with um, diversity and inclusivity and in ensuring that our industry itself is well represented from a gender perspective, but also from an age perspective. Um, the initiative that we have within um, SICE as an organization, uh, one of them is uh, um, in terms of having to have champions for 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 the different uh, outputs that that we the organization wants to achieve. Some are um, uh, career development in terms of becoming a specialist within your field. Some are uh, ethics, um, some are, um, grow a graduate program. So so in terms of inclusivity and uh, diversity, this what we what we have is we've got we organize talks um, so that young people are able to understand the especially I will say from a gender perspective, but also from a from an age perspective, because that that also speaks to um, in being included within the the bigger scheme of um, the the your career as a, as a young person. So what I, what I'd say is that uh, there has been a rise where the gender gap is trying to be closed within um, our engineering profession, and which is a good thing. And I would like to encourage all even young people here, uh, both male and female, um, young and old, um, to then say, look, if, if, if a portion of our um, um, community is not being uh, encouraged to develop, then technically speaking, we won't find the entire organization or rather um, the entire uh, ecosystem um, of, of engineering having to grow. So such initiatives are what, uh, from a SICE perspective, uh, have been implemented so that we are able to bridge the gap um, between the difference uh, differences that are there within our organization. So yeah, no, that that's that. And I really do hope that each and every person who's here, first and foremost, you understand what is it that you want and what you're good at, and then push at that so that you don't just treat your careers as merely just a job, but something that you can develop in. Um, thanks a lot, Shane. Um, the, the, thank you for the presentation, Jose. I'll hand over to our next speaker, um, who's is here to take us through uh, a conventional, conventional and expanded uh, engineering roles. Uh, this could be include expanding skills to other professions, entrepreneurship, uh, and how she's moved from her background as a chemical engineer to the civil engineering uh, environment. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, OK, you can hear me, hopefully. So just adding on or following on from what Utlozi said about knowing or finding out what it is that you like, that for me has been, as I said, the driving force for how I ended up where I am, where I first worked in cement manufacturing and I discovered what I like and what I like is water. And so it became less important to me that I'm a chemical engineer in a predominantly civil engineering space. It was more important to me that I am a young professional working in the water industry, especially with all of the water stresses um, that we currently have in South Africa and in the global space. 
And so in terms of conventional, conventional civil engineer, sorry, see, I, I, I actually even get confused whether I'm a civil engineer or a chemical engineer, but I am a chemical engineer. So in terms of just traditional chemical engineering roles, um, as I had mentioned previously, chemical engineering just mainly concerns itself with taking a raw product applying all of your engineering skills. Um, it could be chemistry, physics, traditional engineering, and then in a black box, applying processes um, and all of your analytical skills and thinking, and then arrive with a finished product at the end. It could be, again, across multiple industries with how Unilever ends up with a soap that you can go buy off the shelf at pick and pay, or in my case, ending up with a glass of water in your um, um in your homes that doesn't have any adverse effects on your health. And so starting off for me in my career, my first year, um, again, being a chemical engineer who had never previously worked with water and it wasn't uh, my industry predominantly, my first year was just me trying to learn as much as I can about uh, concurrently um, consulting engineer consulting engineering and water engineering and so I in the first year uh, made sure that I aligned myself with as many uh, mentors as I can both direct and indirect uh, mentors and seeing how I could add value and so as mentioned previously the one course that helped me a lot with understanding consulting was a, a course offered by CISA on the consulting space, because it is quite different being in consulting, having come from a manufacturing um, background. And so you want to ensure that you're able to add value and you know what the industry is about and where you fit in holistically within the industry. And then in terms of water as well, so just um, in terms of all of the things that you learn in university that you think, am I really ever going to use this in my career? Is this really useful? Will I ever touch this textbook again? Um, in terms of water, for me, one of the main things that I, I had learned or when I got into the space was seeing the value add of a chemical engineer in a civil space and seeing how I could ensure that the water um, being treated is of an adequate standard so I'm not harming the environment and you're not harming um, humans or industries who consume the water. And so one of the things that I did, which is relevant currently in our climates, which is technology and innovation and being able to upskill and keep up, keep up with all of the um, um, uh, projections that we have um, in the industry where we're moving, um, I identified that when I got into water, there wasn't really many programs that are able to do or perform certain calculations. And I knew that in university, I had done a very brief course on coding. And at that time, I had never thought that I'd actually ever use that again. And so I got into the water space and I sort of refreshed my knowledge on coding and also did a lot of free courses. So there are a lot of free courses available on LinkedIn and a website is at U Udemy, I'm going to say it wrong, but there are a lot of um, um, openware softwares and, and, and spaces where there are free courses that you can use to constantly upskill. So I spent a chunk of my time in that first year and second year um, honing in and learning new skills on how I could add value. Because at the end of the day, I wanted to create a program where we could do all calculations on water treatments without having to pull out a textbook um, and started from scratch. I also wanted to make it pretty enough and easy enough to use that if I'm not there, the next person who comes in is able to derive and get the information from the program without um, any hassles. And so I was bold enough to first do that from scratch and then go into a space. Um, at that time, it was a conference in MISA. And one of the first lessons there just on that space is to attend every conference and every opportunity where there is um, um, different different roles and different um, branches of engineering so you can learn as much as you can. So I was bold enough to say I'm going to present this tool to 
the rest of the professionals and the rest of the industry to see how we can all add value onto it and all use it. So again, we are up to date with technology. And as another tip just outside of doing things that are extra, you know, like coding, is to ensure that you take as many opportunities to upskill on simple things such as Excel. Um, there are basic Excel skills and there are advanced Excel skills. Again, there are lots of free courses that you can find on LinkedIn to make sure that you are as up to date and as skilled as possible so you can add value. And so that is the one major tip I have on that. Identify in every space that you go in, identify how you can add value and how you can use what you've learned to add value. If you identify that you actually haven't done any, you don't have the necessary skills, look up and do not be afraid to look up opportunities to learn um, that skill and be an expert in eventually and add value. After that, um, on, on, on the path of looking for opportunities and funding and bursaries, I then decided that what I know in water is not enough. I want to know much more. I then looked up scholarship opportunities because I then decided that I wanted a master's degree. And so in terms of looking for opportunities outside of, um, you know, being a student, I keep saying, don't be afraid to start over even professionally. And so at that point, I had worked for three years and I decided I still want to learn more and I'm still not afraid to go back to school and start afresh. Well, not start afresh, but to enhance what I know. And so I found a scholarship and all of the tips actually that were presented here on interview topics were entirely um, useful and how I landed a scholarship and was able to then go overseas and get um, be able to enhance what I know in water. And another uh, tip on that also just in the space of being in South Africa, being in the African context and then being international um, best practices is to know, oh, sorry, um, okay. Sorry, sorry. I am having technological failings. Okay, which is why we need to keep up to date with how much we know about technology. Just anything can happen at any time. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Um, so yeah, um, my main, my main um, message in terms of just being in the workspace and being someone who doesn't know, um, coming in fresh, not knowing the industry is to take opportunity and learn as much as you can, identify mentors in the space, define where you want to take your career and to be bold enough to say, I don't actually know anything in this space, but I want to learn. I'm a chemical engineer. I learned about all sorts of other processes and very little about water, but I'm going to stay here and I'm going to learn and I'm going to add value. And if I figure out that I don't actually know this, I'm going to take a course, I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to come back and add value. And so yeah, that is my main main message with that regard. All right, uh, uh, th thank you for your presentation. I'll hand over to our next speaker, who is Philip. Uh, the, you can go ahead, Philip, if you want to share your screen. Thank you. Uh, Andile, I'm just going to quickly try and do that. There we go. No, okay. Um, no. Sorry, technology. There we go. Can you see life lessons on your side? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm going to skip the, the, let's say, the academic session that I'm actually supposed to talk on and do three minutes on this session. The topic that I was supposed to talk on was really the almost the, the convergence of the various engineering disciplines. And um, but I think in the few minutes it's left over, I think this is more more useful. So as I say, these are life lessons that I've learned, and um, you can use it or don't use it. This this graphic is very important 
to remember in every, every decision and every point in your life. Looking forward, you've got various paths that's going to take you to your ultimate self. But looking backwards, you can't change it. That's fixed. So that gray line there in the middle that says today, yesterday you can't do anything about, but for tomorrow you can still make decisions, change things, and um, change the course of your direction. Then my next slide is something that um, I've spend a lot of stress on university wherever you are studying even at school you tend to to not focus on your studies and neglect it and then get uh, just 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 into your exams with a 40 mark and then expect a miracle to obtain a 60 pass rate to have a 50 average to um, pass your course and that is option one so you, you work for 40% semester mark, then you think you're going to achieve 60%. That is very, very, very difficult to do, and it comes with lots of stress. Option two is a much better way of doing it. You work throughout the semester. You say no to friends going out for social events or whatever, and you go to that tutorial at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you get that one point by doing an a example question and submit it and you keep on doing that and then you end up having a 60% semester mark and then you only need to achieve 40% in the exam but you will most probably achieve 60% because you have averaged that throughout your year. Next, volunteer and meet new people. I think some of the previous uh, speakers also said that that is really a good way to build your, your network and, and, and just expand your, your skill set. This is very important in every aspect of your life. Do what you say you're gonna do, plain and simple. Don't, don't commit to anything. If, if you commit to something and you say, I'll do it tomorrow, and you know full well that you won't be able to do it tomorrow, don't commit to tomorrow. Rather say, I won't be able to get to it tomorrow. I think Monday is a good time. You can expect it on Tuesday. And then that way you never um, disappoint. This is an important lesson that I've learned from an audio book that I listened to. And it sort of changed the way that I um, conducted myself. And it's the only thing that people will really remember about you is how you made them feel about themselves. And actually, that's actually a very profound thought. And um, if you keep on making people angry and and um, feeling belittled, then uh, you will find yourself standing alone and people leaving your WhatsApp group. Then this book was on my list of things to read. I actually got a hot copy of it. I never read it. And um, I then found it on Audible and I listened it at speed three. And the two slides that follows now is the ones that I've uh, sort of found valuable gems from it. Spend your time in the area that you control. That, that's the middle section of the target. You try to expand your circle of influence. And your circle of concern is, is interesting to think about, but don't waste your energy on that because you can't influence it. Then the next one also from the seven habits is the quadrants that you need to spend your time in. If you can focus most of your time in the not urgent, important section, that is where you prepare for presentations, preparations, where you get the value, planning, you're building relationships and everything, and you don't spend time in the not, not in the urgent, not important things, really just running from one crisis to the other. The next slide is, a, is an example, it's just a different version of it where um, if you spend your time in the not urgent important side, you're a prioritizer. But if you spend your time in the urgent, not important, you can almost say you're a yes man. And then this is the slide that I already mentioned about uh, 20 years. And that's my story. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. And Thank you to all the speakers for, for keeping it brief. And 
I wanted just to try and keep it brief so that we can bring on board a lot of questions, a lot of interaction from our panel as well. I'll start with the questions. Uh, I think my first question is, is you, Jabli. I've, I've always wondered um, from uh, what 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 different organizations look at, and I'd like to know from 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 your organizations, what do you look for in a new hire, be it a graduate or a junior professional? What what do you want to see when you see someone you take on as a new hire? All right, no, thanks for that. Um, so what we look for, um, basic, okay. <laughs> so number one, um, that their academic record shows clearly that they have put effort into their studies. Um, so um, I, I know there was a thing that um, not everyone is finishing a degree in four years, but I mean, um, there's got to be reasons maybe why certain things were not done. Um, and, and that's why we're not just looking at a qualification certificate, but we're going through the years and seeing how you have um, progressed and performed. Um, if you've repeated certain things, was it a number of times and why not? Um, so um, a good um, academic record to start with. Um, secondly, um, a good attitude. Um, because um, if, 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 if you're smart, but you've got a stinking attitude, you're not going to fit into the culture. Um, so we need people who are going to come here um, and um, fit into the culture. And that's why we do shadow match. There's something we do here at Jones and Wagner called shadow match. Um, we not only take new recruits through it, but we take bursary applicants through it as well, um, which then, I mean, we've got a certain benchmark. Um, we tested a few people here in the company that we think um, are the ideal Jones and Wagner person. Um, and from that created a benchmark um, so that our bursary students, our new recruits, we test against that and see if they're going to be a fit. Um, so those are the things that we're looking for. Good attitude, good um, academics, um, and just, just someone who's wanting to work um, and make a difference. Um, the, 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 thank you so much for the response. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions from the, from, uh, the chat and the other participants. Please raise your hand if you have a question or type it on the... Um, on the chat box. Uh, my next question is to Busisiwe. Um, I think a, a lot of graduates uh, would like to study abroad and understand what opportunities exist uh, there. Um, if you can just just explain how you went about uh, getting the opportunity to study abroad and um, how that experience was. Thank you. Okay, um, so when I started out, my intention wasn't actually to go abroad. I was looking for a course um, that had or would meet all of my requirements in terms of where I wanted to go in my career. And that unfortunately or fortunately was in England. Um, unfortunately, it was cold. Um, was in England. And so in terms of um, how I actually managed to do that, so there are many um, websites and, and opportunities out there. It's just a, a matter of unlocking them. One of the ones that I had um, applied for is called Shevening. And so they fund um, people who have uh, in their early careers. So say you've worked for, I think it's about three years and you're trying to identify where you want to go next. So you've worked for a few years, you want to know where to go next, and you are, as they describe, a change maker, you want to make an impact in your industry, and they have or had these categories. So one of the ones where I fit in was the water space. So we have a water crisis or a water challenge. How do we get professionals who can then um, go in that space, go study internationally and come back in their home countries and make a difference in that country and not actually stay abroad because what's the use of, you know, learning <laughs> and then going um, and staying somewhere else. And so you just work through an application and scholarship applications are, I'm not going to lie, they are so 
really, really tedious. But if you know why you're doing them, because the one main question with all bursaries and scholarships, they ask you, why do you want to do this? And if you have a solid answer for why do I want to do this? Why do I want to contribute to the water space? Why do I want to learn further? It is really an easy opportunity to unlock. And so, yeah, I went over to England, did a lot of side visits to try and see what they do with their water treatment plants or what their challenges are and to see what we can then apply in the African context. And the truth is a lot of it actually isn't. You have to cater for, for the markets and the environments and, and our climate and where we are um, and then see what it is that we can apply and realistically and what it is that we cannot. But whatever the opportunity is, you still learn and you still get to know what is out there and how you can um, better improve. Right, thank you. Um, uh, it's good that you followed the scholarship guidelines and came back to South Africa. <laughs> um, I, I see there's a question, it's more directed to CISA. It says, Does co do consulting member companies notify CISA when they are volunteering or available opportunities for volunteering? Uh, from Geoffrey Malisela. Uh, Godfrey, can you take that question? Okay, uh, thank you, Andile. Um, I hope I am understanding the question, or maybe I was supposed to use the technique here, Jabulile, uh, to to ask the person to rephrase the question again. But maybe let me say this, and uh, oh, Jeffrey can come back again. So CISA represents about six hundred companies, uh, and CISA is a voluntary organization. So, like today. Uh, the speakers that are in attendance are volunteers of CISA, uh, and Lozi is a volunteer from government and also from, from SISI. So there are opportunities for employees of member firms to volunteer uh, within the work of the association and other industry uh, organization. Uh, so I, I hope... Um, I've touched on it. Maybe, Philip, you are able to, to translate it differently. Godfrey, yes, I think um, from CISA point of view, there is no specific requirement. However, it's a very good platform to reach a large audience very quickly. So uh, maybe maybe it's a it's a it's something that we can explore further with CISA to ask member firms to let us know when they've got um, work workplace bursaries, anything like that, and then we can send it through member firms and then um, through the YPF and get get to the right people quicker. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Andile. All right. Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, well, Philip, since yes, you're, you're still here. Um, um, you, you mentioned the part of uh, how to building a 25 year career uh, is uh, you have to build that career. Um, uh, what, 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 what is your advice to young professionals in, in, in that regard? I think I, I think there was a bit of room for you to expand on that and and, and um, get us out of our new norm where every two, three years we want to jump ship, go somewhere else, you know. Uh, change our minds after three years, come back, you know, that type of thing. And it's a consistent trajectory uh, for, for our group of young professionals. Um, how, how do you build that 25-year career? And what are the key elements that you want to have throughout that entire process that can help you build that, uh, that, 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 that successful long-term career? Okay, yes, thank you, Andile. Um, I'll try my best to, to assist there. I think I think the very first um, important thing is to remember that as you come out of your tertiary education, you know you know how to do things. You've learned the academic traits, but you you haven't applied it in your in your life yet. You you, you and and you must be open to learn the practical way of applying your skill set. And not always will the 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 theory match the let's say the practice. 
that's that's the important thing. The other thing is if you if you engage with um, let's say a, a project leader on a specific project, and you you get given a task. As I said in those quick um, life lessons, do what you say you're going to do. So if uh, if for example the the project lead asks you to calculate the catchments and come back with a catchments catchment analysis color coded in terms of big to small or whatever the, the 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 requirement would be don't wait for your project lead who is most probably a very senior person in the company to come back to you and ask you oh did you remember to do that do what you're supposed to do and then go and ask questions when you get stuck don't sit in your office or at your behind your computer if you get stuck and wait for somebody to come to you with the solution you must go and find the solutions because that that defines um i would say let's uh, in afrikaans a uh, start marker it, it's somebody that you can really count on to make your life easier because in, especially in consulting engineering we are juggling a lot of clients a lot of projects a lot of things going wrong and changing on site and you can't the, the 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 normal practical stuff in the office that is really just measure something and check yourself then i would say what is important is to um carry keep on learning and it's not necessary that it has to be a formal course um some of the speakers mentioned there's various forms of free free courses free literature out there there's google there's really um there's so much that you can learn and an example again when i was starting to work on dolomite i was i was never taught that at university um so you self-learn i took the science 1936 i studied that if i can show you my copy of that document it, it's highlighted, there's red arrows, there's NB, there is circles around it. Then there's notes saying this is contradicting that uh, clause. And you need to make it sort of part of your own and uh, move on, gain the experience. And then also never be afraid, like Jabulile said, to say, I don't know. If you don't know, then you can always find somebody in the in the industry to assist and again the example you specialist i've reached out to trevor green at jones and wagner i've reached out to another gentleman peter creer at tech world he's a specialist um traffic engineer i've reached out to mc barnard in cape town who's a, a specialist pavement design engineer you the, the space is too big to think that you can be a know-it-all and if you end up being a know-it-all you end up getting yourself into trouble saying you can do things that you can't do and then you could open up yourself to a PI claim. But that's maybe a topic for another day. I hope that I've answered the question. Um, no, th 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 thank you for that answer. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other question on the... Uh, I see you have your hand up, Mark. Please go ahead. The question. Um, we can't hear you. I think if you're having challenges with your audio, please type the question on the chat. But I see, okay, I see you've muted yourself. Um, I'll ask a question while we wait to check your question in the chat. Um, so my question is to, to, to Josie. I think from your um, presentation of being an active participant and being part of the inclusion and diversity, you mentioned the role that SciSE uh, plays. Um, uh, 
if if you can just just guide uh, some of the YPs or, or the young professionals who are here who how how they can participate in the activities um, for SICE, um, CISA, and where they can find those. I think in some instances, some young young professionals can find those activities, and how they can take part in in some of the the the, the programs that you have there, and what programs you also have um, under SICE and CISA. Thanks. And also, what that if that your future leadership program is. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Andile. Yeah, no, I think um, in terms of uh, SICE, uh, so SICE is a voluntary organization um, and uh, for civil engineers. So technically speaking, when you when you um, register with the, the organization, there's an annual fee that you pay. But um, from a student perspective, when, when, when people are, are students, they, they don't pay anything. Um, it's only after you graduate um, and then you you now start working. That's when now you are able then to become a full, I would say, a, a, at a point they'll call you a, a an associate member, and then ultimately you are then a corporate member. So so that that in terms of how you you get involved with the organization, the the organization's website is uh, sic.org.za. Uh, you can find it on 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 the uh, on the internet. But also the social media pages, which is SIC Civil, um, and then for FLP, which is uh, like I said, so SIC, uh, the, what happens with SIC is that it is a it uh, it has different divisions. I would and, and also panel a division. We mean in terms of specialization. So specialization, like I said, there's transport, water, uh, geotech. Or, so those are called divisions. And in terms of panels panels you have what you'd call the future leaders panel which is a panel made up of young people across uh, the country uh, to represent uh, the members at their different areas so areas would then be covered as a uh, as a, a branch so what you have like now as you mentioned you are uh, the chairperson of the YPF uh, North uh, Houting. So then also with, with SIC, you will also have um, that type of leadership structure. So what we then do as FLP is then we have a lot of initiatives that we do uh, in terms of encouraging and, and, and assisting young people to register professionally. As you know that um, uh, we are a learned institution. So learned meaning we, we uh, specialize or focus on professionals. So therefore, then we encourage and and, and offer courses to to civil engineers uh, of different specializations on, uh, on 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 courses that they want to attend, and then like contracts management um, and and other special uh, specialist uh, topics. And then the other thing we will then uh, have road shows where we do the same thing that we're doing now in this uh, event. We'll then have road shows where we engage universities. Um, and, and also high schools to teach them more about what engineering is, but also the perspective that they need to have, also how they need to prepare for them for their career going forward and what to look out for in terms of creating also that mentorship, men, uh, a mentor and mentee relationship between the two. So something that we focus on, as you know, uh, especially within our country, uh, the profession itself, uh, previously it was, uh, I would say, uh, either male dominated or culturally dominated um, uh, into, uh, uh, type of people. So what we've done is that we have then um, tried through future leaders panel to then say, look, young people need mentors. So because they need mentors, FLP then focuses on those type of initiatives where we are able to then help young people either get jobs or get mentored, or maybe get expertise. Something that a question was asked, I think now uh, Godfrey tried to answer it in terms of saying, what does CISA do? Uh, does it have information from member companies? Uh, from SICE's side, obviously we're not affiliated with a company, but rather a, a member itself. So what, what we'll then have to do is that, um, what we would do is that we have what you, a, a portal where you would then, as a young person who requires 
uh, a, a mentor, you would um, register your information, and also as a somebody who can also be a mentee, you can register your information. Also, if a company wants to hire people, it can also register uh, their information, more like PNET, if uh, a lot of people maybe understand it. So so, so we have that structure. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can just email uh, SIC marketing, uh, the amount of marketing at SIC, uh, dot org dot za, then you can be able to find more information on that. I do know, obviously, we are specializing in different uh, fields, but in terms of uh, civil engineering, that is the opportunities that are there from from SIC side. And then, um, yeah, I think I think I think I answered the question uh, comprehensively. Hopefully, that that gives gives all the aspiring civil engineers uh, the information. Thanks. Um. Thanks. Uh, I see. We literally have. But uh, yeah, no time. I'll just take these two last questions that I hear that I think uh, I'd like Chabule and, uh, and Philip to answer. Chabule, I think if you can answer a question from Debo Hoys. Um, the question is, what are the benefits of being a regist ex-registered member? Also, how important is it to register as, as part of being a professional technician or engineer with EXA? Because I see most posts now require a professional a registered professional member. Yeah, no, it's, it's extremely important. Um, and if you're going to be an engineer who's going to take ownership and accountability for your work um, to prove um, your competence, um, having PR next to your name um, is very important. Um, of course, for youngsters, it's difficult because you need to be um, in a company that has a commitment and undertaking to train you up to the level that you can professionally register, right? So, I mean... Um, the group that we're speaking to here is, is fresh graduates um, and students. What's important for you is that you register as a candidate um, so that um, even in, in your interview, you can show that I'm, I'm serious about my journey of becoming a professional engineer. I've taken the step of registering as a candidate. Um, but for the people who are here who are young uh, graduates and currently employed, um, make sure that you're in a company that's going to expose you um, to uh, proper engineering where you can solve complex problems, where you can get to site so that you can cover the full life cycle um, and be able to register as soon as possible. That will open other opportunities for you um, and open project management type um, opportunities as well. All right, uh, th th thank you for, for, for that uh, response, Chabul. Uh, Philip, uh, the next question is, hi everyone, as a mechanical engineering student, what advice can you offer since I'm about to finish my qualification this year and how do I get a mentor? Just, just a quick one there. Sure, uh, Andile, that's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, but I, would, I would say get onto LinkedIn, look for companies that's offering um, that's got a mechanical engineering skill set um, one example we've got a, a young a graduate here at our office he, a, he he volunteered at university through the university clubs the engineering clubs and things he then got recommended to me as a a fine candidate I, again I looked at his academic record it looked good he's got a fantastic attitude towards life unfortunately at that point in time we did not have um, the free cash flow to employ him and then he said no he's willing to work for free in exchange obviously for mentorship and experience and that's exactly what happened he worked for us I think for almost six months not earning a cent but gaining experience and eventually uh, opportunity arose and then we gave him employment and he's now fully full-time employed with our company gaining experience so the the best way is to to offer your skills free of charge possibly and then in exchange for experience that would be my recommendation um, uh, uh, thank you for that, Philip. I think also to add, um, uh, SIC, uh, SIMEC, I think for mechanical, and CISA also provide uh, good opportunities for YPs, for young professionals to meet with other professionals and then also get mentors and 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 um, other professionals who can guide you. Uh, see, uh, 
Swisha has also replied to your question. I've also shared a link for a vacancy from Steinmuller that's currently active, so you can also have a look at that. And that really is the power of uh, CISA and the network and all the member firms uh, to, to provide the level of interaction that we've had as part of this session. Um, I really appreciate uh, the engagements and the discussions that the panelists have, have, have shared. Um, we wouldn't have gotten it from anywhere else and we really appreciate your taking part in 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 the discussions uh, uh thank you jablila philip uh and and, and Lozi. We, we really appreciate you taking time to guide our yps and share insights from your personal experience and your uh we yeah but we we really appreciate it and, and thank you for that. I think the biggest takeaways for young professionals is um, have the right attitude, um, decide what path you want to take, uh, build your career, um, and also always have uh, the neck and the desire to learn. Um, and, and yeah, thank you so much, uh, Godfrey. I'm not sure if you have anything that you'd like to conclude. Uh, uh, thank you to everyone who attended our, our session. We really appreciate having you here. Uh, Godfrey, I'll hand over to you to close. Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, that was our experience and attempt in trying to achieve workplace readiness uh, for our students, for unemployed graduates, uh, and also try to get some career projection uh, for those that are now working. Thank you very much to all. Uh, this is the end of our session. We're going to do another one on the 18th of July as part of Nelson Mandela's 67 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Good Keep well. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.